He is risen. Now, why would you say a thing like that? Because it's true. But skeptics would say, people who die have a tendency to stay dead. So why would we go around saying that there's a man who died, but now he's been raised back to life? We're going to be talking about the resurrection today because it is Easter. We praise the Lord for, for Resurrection Sunday. We praise the Lord for, for what he did in and through Jesus Christ. We're going to be talking about four implications of the resurrection, four things that the, that the resurrection accomplishes for us as we consider it. Before we get into those implications, though, we just have a few a uh, few things to lay down for groundwork as we consider uh, these four things. Um, as we talk about the resurrection, the resurrection is only relevant if there has been a death. And that is the core of the Christian gospel, right? As, as we have in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 5, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the essence of the gospel. This is the essence of what we believe and teach. And so we're talking about a resurrection this morning because first there's been a death. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ was betrayed, brutally beaten, and horrifically murdered and died on, hung on a cross until he died. And so as we think about the resurrection, it is important to remember that it is within the context of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ physically died and he was physically raised to life again. That is what we believe and that is what we proclaim. He wasn't figuratively raised to life as, as some would proclaim. This isn't just a nice story or a fairy tale, but we believe this is historical fact. This happened. And if it happens, there are some implications. And we're going to examine some implications, and we're going to look at four of them and see how does this actually impact us? How does this really, I mean, okay, we say that he died and rose again, but how does this actually impact my life? Because whether you realize it or not, the resurrection of Jesus Christ does have implications for your life and mine, both today, tomorrow, and, and all the way through to our death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has significant implications. The first implication is that if the resurrection happens, then Christianity is true. And I don't know where you're at this morning. We all come from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different places. If you do not, would not yet say that you are a Christian, or if you're not sure, you're on the fence, you, you're not quite sure about this Jesus guy or about the resurrection or, or these things, if you don't know for certain where you stand on these issues, this is key. This is so important. The Bible is very honest about the implications of the resurrection. And the Bible itself says that if the resurrection is not true, if it did not happen, then our faith is worthless. We are still in our sins. If the resurrection did not happen, this whole Christianity thing, pure and utter nonsense. Just forget it. So while I have up here, if the resurrection happened, then Christianity is too. The reverse is also true. If the resurrection did not happen, then Christianity is false. Those are some pretty serious implications. 
in the Bible, again, is wide open about those implications. Check out 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 15. If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. That's pretty serious. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, my preaching here this morning, worthless. Your faith here this morning, garbage, worthless. And I'm a liar on top of all that. False witnesses about God because we testified wrongly that God raised him from the dead. The stakes could not be any higher. Christianity rises or falls on the veracity or the truthfulness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Rises or falls on the veracity of the resurrection. So how do we know it's true? This is what we proclaim. This is what the Bible says. How do we know that this actually happened? How do we know that's true, that this happened? Because I wasn't there. I mean, this happened 2,000 years ago. You weren't there. So how do we know? In short, the, the historical evidence strongly favors that it happened. And when I say strongly favors, what I mean is it's practically indisputable that this is historical fact. When it comes to knowing how things happened in history, we're dependent upon historical documents. And these documents tell us things. But the problem that we run into is that not all historical documents are equally reliable. So there's a bunch of tests that we have to run that we have to figure out, okay, is, is this particular document telling the truth? And we have historical documents in the scriptures. These are documents that were written nearly 2,000 years ago that speak of the events in the Bible. And so there are ways to try to ascertain and try to understand, okay, is this document the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Mark? Are, are these documents telling the truth about what happened? And there are various tests that can be uh, applied to see if any given document should be accepted. But I want you to know that the Bible, the documents that we have handed down to us, they pass all the tests. Any tests that is, can be thrown out there to understand if, a, if any historical document is considered reliable, the scriptures pass those tests. And in fact, the evidence is so strong in the favor of the scriptures that even scholars who reject Christianity as a religion, those scholars even have a difficult time trying to explain away what the scriptures teach about the resurrection. They have such a hard time that they can only come up with a few theories, and these theories are quite problematic. I'm going to share with you some of the theories that have been advanced as they try to explain away the resurrection and just show how futile they are in trying to refute the scriptures. One theory that they have is that the disciples stole the body. They have to account for an empty tomb somehow. That is considered a historical fact even by the most secular scholarship. There is an empty tomb where Jesus Christ was buried. How do we explain that? So they say, well, maybe the disciples stole the body. Maybe they were able to, to get it and, and hide it and then proclaim that he had risen from the dead. There are numerous problems with this theory. First is that the scriptures, they paint the disciples basically as incompetent cowards. These are a group of guys that can constantly don't understand what Jesus is teaching and doing. They're constantly struggling with things, and, and when the going gets tough, they run away, and they hide. So there's armed guards at the tomb. To say that the disciples stole the body is to say that we're expected to believe that the disciples were able to overcome Roman soldiers, soldiers that were trained to fight to the death, and that if they failed to do their job, they face execution by the Roman government. These warriors are not going to let a bunch of ragtag disciples 
steal this body. And furthermore, the disciples were all severely persecuted and ultimately brutally murdered for teaching that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If they stole the body and hid it, and they all knew that this whole thing was a sham and a lie, why would they allow themselves to be subjected to stoning, to being crucified upside down, boiled alive, drawn and quartered, beheaded, because they refused to recant? Did you think at least one of them would have fessed up and said, no, fine, I admit it, we stole the body. But not a single one did. And they all were tortured numerous times and ultimately killed for the proclamation that the resurrection happened. So this whole theory about the disciples stole the body doesn't hold a lot of water. Second, they try to say, well, well, maybe they just went to the wrong tomb. There's an empty tomb. Well, they just went to the wrong one. And they got there, they saw it was empty, and okay, it's all, uh, all right, but he rose. <laughs> all I'm going to say about that is that if that was the case, the authorities at the time, all they would have had to do is open up the correct tomb, pop up the body and say, no, he didn't rise from the dead. We got him right here, and Christianity would have been done like that. So it's, it's pretty ridiculous to say that they just went to the wrong tomb. Third idea, the swoon theory. And if you've heard of this, this has probably been the most popular theory among recent scholarship, but it too has many problems. According to this theory, Jesus didn't actually die to begin with, but he merely fainted or he passed out on the cross. And when they took him down and laid him in the tomb, in the cool of the tomb, he revived, moved the stone out of the way from in front of the tomb, overpowered the guards, and then traveled around and showed up in various places around the countryside. Just on the face of it, it sounds pretty implausible. But as we recognize and see what actually happens to someone when they're crucified, we see that it is beyond implausible. See, when Jesus was crucified, this is what happened. This is a description of, uh, a summarized description of what happened to Jesus Christ. He was whipped, which tore the flesh off of his back. He was severely beaten. That alone would have taken weeks to recover from. Then he was nailed to a cross, and in the process of raising the cross upright, it would have slammed down into a hole in the ground, and his shoulders and elbows would have been pulled out of socket. As he hung, it would have been increasingly difficult to breathe, and as a result, because of the position he'd be hanging in, the lungs would begin to collapse and fill with fluid. As he lost blood and oxygen, he would have extreme cramps and spasms in his muscles and his arms and legs. In order to compensate for the loss of blood and oxygen, the heart would begin to beat faster and faster. And the end result, either he would suffocate as his lungs were completely filled with fluid, or he would suffer cardiac rupture, and the heart would literally burst from the strain on the heart. It's physically impossible for even the strongest man to endure what Jesus endured and not die. Even if he somehow managed to survive the torture of the cross itself when he was pulled down there is no way that he would have, had to, would have been able to recover the strength necessary in just a short matter of time in order to move that stone away, overpower armed, trained soldiers, and travel about the countryside. Jesus Christ died. There's no way around that. And that's the best theory that secular scholarship that rejects Christianity, that's the best theory they have to explain the events of the Bible. To try to explain away the resurrection, to try to explain why there's an empty tomb. That's the best they've got. It just doesn't hold up to examination. So again, as we consider this claim, Christianity rises or falls on the veracity, the truthfulness of the resurrection. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our faith is worthless. 
But like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. It happened. And we praise the Lord for that. And since the resurrection is true, which it is, then Christianity, the gospel message of the scriptures is true. And that's a significant implication. We have a true message. Something that my pastor always used to say growing up is that truth never has to be afraid of investigation. Truth never has to be afraid of asking probing questions because it's true. And that's what we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can investigate it all you want. The evidence points towards the veracity and the truthfulness of God's word, that this is a historical event. Because it is true, and because we have this knowledge, we will be held accountable for this knowledge. In fact, that is something that Paul, uh, when he was preaching in Acts 17, and I apologize, I have a ton of passages to show you this morning, so I've got them on the screen. If, if you can write them down to keep up or just read them, flip, however you want to do it. But uh, you have quite a few passages we're looking at this morning. But Acts 17, 30 and 31, Paul is preaching. He says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. That man is Jesus Christ. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. We will be held accountable for what we do with this message. One day, that judge is going to judge the world in righteousness. We know this is true because God has provided proof of it in raising Jesus Christ from the dead. This is historical fact. If you still have doubts or questions or you want clarification on any of that, feel free to talk to me. I'm all ears. Hit me with your best shot. But scriptures and the witness they bear is pretty clear. So that is our first implication, that Jesus' resurrection is proof that the gospel message in its entirety is true. And because of that implication, we have responsibility. We have a responsibility to repent and believe, as, as God says here, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. We have the responsibility to share that with others, letting them know that one day there is going to be a judge that will judge the world in righteousness. And we need to be ready for that day. That's our first implication. The second, the resurrection secures our justification. Some aspects of this uh, implication are over cover, uh, they're kind of overlapping with the first implication. There's some overlap here. Um, we need to understand this word justification. You know, it's, it's, it's a big theolo theological word. Um, justification is simply God's legal declaration that someone is righteous in his sight. It is God declaring someone to be in a right relationship with him. No one is born justified. We all are all born in an incorrect relationship with the Lord. And at the moment of conversion, at the moment we, we place our trust in Jesus Christ, we are justified. We are declared righteous, declared to be in a right relationship with God. And it's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that secures that possibility. Again, as we consider 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sin. He's connecting the reality of our justification, of our forgiveness of our sins, to the reality of the resurrection. These are linked concepts that we have together for us. If Jesus didn't rise, we're still in our sins. We have not been justified. But Jesus did rise. So justification is made possible for those who believe because of the resurrection. Check out Romans chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, 
He was delivered up for our trespass and raised for our justification. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to secure our justification to secure our righteous standing before God, being in that right relationship with Him. We have the idea, this this concept of of righteousness being credited to our account. See, we're all born without righteousness. We're born without any righteousness of our own. So as we think about this, we can almost say bankrupt of righteousness. But what happened on the cross, when Jesus died, our unrighteousness was credited to Jesus' account. And he took, he paid the penalty, he paid our fine that we could not pay. And when he died, he shouted out a phrase right before he passed away, right before he gave up the spirit, John 19, 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. That comes from a Greek word which was used in accounting. It's an accounting term. Carries the idea of paid in full. So Jesus, he took our unrighteousness, it was credited to his account, and in his death, the penalty that we deserve was paid in full at the cross. Jesus paid our debt to the Father. But how do we know that this debt was accepted, this payment was accepted? How do we know that God looked upon that payment and said, okay, yep, that's good? That's where the resurrection comes in. The resurrection is proof that God accepted the payment of Jesus Christ on the cross. The resurrection is God's receipt, in a way, that that was an acceptable sacrifice. And so now, when we repent and believe in Jesus Christ, when we place our faith in Him, God will take Jesus' righteousness and credit that to our account. So the transaction becomes complete. And it is only because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that that transaction is made possible. Because it is a resurrection that demonstrates that that payment was accepted. So that we may receive Christ's righteousness. So the resurrection secures our justification. That is the second implication. The third implication, the resurrection secures our sanctification. Now that might be a new concept. You might wonder, what, what does the resurrection have to do with, with our sanctification? turns out quite a bit as we look at some passages this morning. But first, I want to help us understand what we mean when I say sanctification. Again, that's another uh, more theological-sounding word. What, what is this term for sanctification? Sanctification is the process by which God makes us holy. It's the process by which we grow as Christians. It speaks of how we act and conduct ourselves. The more sanctified we are, the more we behave the way Jesus would have us to behave. So it's our grow, growth as Christians and our Christian walk. And as we grow in holiness, we grow as Christians. But this growth is only possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'll read for us Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, 
so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not die and rise from the dead so that we could continue in our sin. Jesus Christ did not die and rise again so that we could just keep on living like we always lived. The very idea that a Christian could live in continual sin was so reprehensible to Paul that he used the strongest possible terms in his language to express his thought. Should we continue in sin? No, 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 no! That's the force of absolutely not! This is not how we conduct ourselves. Don't you know that Christ died for this? Don't you know that that Christ raised to life so that we too could walk in newness of life? Jesus didn't rise from the dead to give us new life so that we could continue to live like we're still dead. So that sin in our life. Jesus was dead. Jesus died and raised again to free us from that. He rose again so he could free you from speaking falsehood or free you from all the sins that we have from from gossip, from, uh, from our porn addictions, from our pride, from our anger, our anxieties. He died to free us from all of that. We're commanded in various places of Scripture to put those things to death. Get rid of it. Put the old man off. Put away its practices. Now, on one hand, that could sound like a maybe a depressing command. <laughs> How am I supposed to do that? It's hard. These things, the, the temptation is just so strong. the responsibility to do all this, if I have the responsibility to, to put all that stuff off on my own, I, I don't know if I can do that. It, it's difficult. It's discouraging. That's the best part. You don't have to do it alone. Yes, Jesus died and was raised to life to free you from the sin that is in your life. And you are commanded to remove that sin and to put it off from you. But there is wonderful power for the Christian to actually accomplish that. And that power was, is brought to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and 20. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. There is incredible, immeasurable, great power at work within us according to the mighty working of his strength. He exercised this same power that works within us. He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Do you hear what that's saying? The same power that was exercised by God to raise a man to life. He was dead, raised him to life. That same power is at work in those who believe in him. That same power is at work to free you from your sin. So that we do not have to worry about fighting these battles on our own. We have the resurrection power of God within us to root out these practices from us. If that's not good news, I don't know what is. 
Because I know I can't do that on my own. I can't free myself from these things on my own. It, the flesh is just too weak. So Jesus died, Jesus rose again to free us from our sin, and he gives us the power to actually accomplish that practically in our daily lives. That's amazing. So I wonder, have you experienced that power in your life? Can you think back and think, you know, there's been, there was a sin that, that used to be so appealing to me, that used to be just something that just dominated my life, and, and now that I don't find that I do that anymore. That's God's resurrection power at work within you. You know, I can think back in my own life, in my high school years, how I, I was hopelessly addicted to pornography. I could not break myself from that. But God's grace and God's strength and His power, His resurrection power has been at work in my life and I can say that is no longer a part of my life. And that's not a testament to me. I don't say that as a point of pride because that's God's grace. That's His working in my life. I know the weakness of my own flesh and where it would go if it was left to its own, own desires. But by God's grace, he has broken the power of those chains within me. I praise the Lord for that. I praise the Lord so much for that. And, and I hope that that's something that you've experienced. And I would encourage you to consider if that isn't something you've experienced, is if you still find that, that you are still dealing with some of the same life-dominating sins that you've been dealing with for such a long time, I'm going to say something hard. But I want you to consider it. I want, you to encourage, I want to encourage you to at least consider that it's possible that it's because you don't have new life to begin with. That's not a statement of me judging you. Scripture commands us to examine ourselves, to see if we are in the faith. I am simply encouraging you to do that. If you have not experienced this resurrection power in your life where you find that you are conquering sins and the sins that used to be part of your life are no longer part of your life, if that's not part of your experience, just consider and examine yourself to see if you truly are in the faith as Scripture commands us to examine ourselves to do. But the resurrection... The implications of that resurrection is not just our justification securing a right standing before God, but it is resurrection power in my life today to free me from my sin. That is a significant implication. Fourth and final implication, the resurrection secures our glorification Part of the great hope that we have as Christians is that this term that we call glorification. It's this Christian doctrine that teaches that when we die, those who follow Jesus Christ, when we die, our spirit separates from our body and it goes into the presence of the Lord. There is coming a day when God will resurrect our physical bodies, will transform or glorify those physical bodies and our body and our soul will be reunited once again. And we will be in the new heavens and the new earth with Christ for all eternity. This is what Paul says. I have a couple verses where he says this. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Then he says something similar in 2 Corinthians 4, 14. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ serves as a guarantee of our own future resurrection when our bodies will be raised and glorified, transformed. And we read several verses from uh, 1 Corinthians 15 in the context of that passage. Paul is dealing with a group of people that don't believe that there will one day be a future resurrection. And Paul is addressing those claims 
And saying, whoa, 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 if there's no resurrection, then not even Jesus has been raised from the dead. And if Jesus hasn't been raised, then we're toast. Loose paraphrase. But he goes on to say that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and his, and his resurrection guarantees our own. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 23. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward at his coming those who belong to Christ. So we have this term first fruits, and that might, uh, might not be familiar terminology to us. It's just the idea of a harvest. Uh, and the very first crops that were harvested, the very first portion of the crop that would have become ripe, that would be considered the first fruits. And when uh, those first fruits would be considered a harbinger of what is to come with the full harvest. So if the first fruits were good and plentiful, the harvest would be good and plentiful. If the first fruits weren't so good, likewise, the full harvest would be not so good. So that is the concept of first fruits. And so Jesus is called the first fruits in regards to resurrection. His own resurrection serves as a harbinger of what is to come, that there is going to be a great harvest, a great resurrection of all those who belong to him. At his coming, all those who belong to Christ will be resurrected. If that doesn't excite you, Listen to what Paul describes those resurrection bodies to be like. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Then several verses later, oops. Uh-oh. Well, in first, several verses later, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57, he says this. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we will all be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. And when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your sting? Where death is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful picture? We always have aches and pains that we deal with. Just, just things that just, man, my body isn't all that great. Maybe it once was, but man, it's starting to get older. I'm not feeling so good anymore. Arthritis, gone. Back pain, gone. Vision problems, gone. Hearing issues, migraine, plantar fasciitis, bad knees, bad shoulders, cancers, illnesses, allergies, all of it gone. And it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that guarantees that that will be our reality. So those are four implications of the resurrection. If the resurrection is true, then Christianity is true. If the message of the gospel is true. We have a responsibility to that, to believe it and to proclaim it. Resurrection secures our justification for those who believe. The resurrection is proof that God accepts the payment of Jesus Christ on the cross 
and those who respond in repentance and faith will be credited the righteousness of Christ. Resurrection secures uh, the sanctification of all believers. Again, Jesus didn't die and rise again for us to remain in our sins, but died and rose again that we may walk in newness of life. But he also provides the resurrection power of God to actually accomplish that. And finally, the resurrection secures our glorification. One day, this mortal, corruptible body, this decaying body, will put on immortality. Death will be defeated. Sorrows will be no more. And it is the resurrection of Christ that secures that reality for us. And it is that truth of the resurrection that that makes me love the song, I Will Rise. It's so powerful to me. The chorus of that song says, I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. So the Christian, take heart. We have the true message of the Bible. We have the true truth of of salvation. And it is bound up in the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fullness of our salvation, our justification, sanctification, and glorification, the fullness of our salvation is wrapped up in this truth of the resurrection. We don't have to wonder or tiptoe around this issue. Again, truth never has to be afraid of investigation. We can have confidence in this reality. If you are not yet a Christian, you're not quite sure yet, you know, I'm still thinking about it, thinking about it. I just plead with you. Do not delay. Place your faith in the resurrected Savior today. These promises of new life, of a right relationship with God, of new life where we can put away old practices and and walk in newness of life, these promises of a resurrected body, those two can be for you if you repent and believe this message. But you must repent. You must place your faith in the Savior. He died, he was buried, he resurrected so that you might not perish, so that you could have life. But you must act on this information. Consider once more the words of of Acts 17 that were read earlier. God now commands all people to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. And he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So please, don't let this day end until you have trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation. The resurrection is a marvelous truth. And I hope you're encouraged by it and, and can, can walk in, in new ways because of this truth and share it with others. This is what the apostles bore witness to and is what we are called to bear witness to as well. And I pray we can all rejoice in this Easter Sunday. He is risen. Yes, he is. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, without this resurrection, without this truth, our whole faith is worthless and we're still in our sins. We do not have justification. We do not have the ability uh, to be sanctified or even the hope of glorification. None of that's a factor if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, but we thank you so much that we do have this truth, that we can be confident that Jesus did rise from the dead. It's not just a fairy tale or a story, but it happened. It's historical fact. I do pray that as we go about our daily lives, Lord, that we can be faithful to share this with others, helping people to see 
that this is historical fact and that they too may have life in you because of the resurrection. I pray that we can be faithful to to put to death those things which uh, are not in accordance with your will. And I thank you for the power that you have supplied to actually accomplish that in our lives. And I pray that we would tap into that and that you would accomplish that in us. And Lord, we do look forward to the day when we will rise and stand before you. Sorrows and pain will be forgotten. We will stand before you with our resurrected bodies and enjoy the presence of your glory for all eternity. All because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.